So uh, thank you for joining us uh, right before lunch, too. Um, so this talk is about AVA, uh, which is a uh, design that's the result uh, of collaboration between Facebook and Microsoft, and is one of the ways that we're looking at deploying NVMEM.2 into scale-out storage. Uh, my name is Dominic Cheng. I'm a hardware engineer at Facebook. Uh, working on the storage team, and uh, well, soon to be joining me is Michael Liverte, uh, who is a partner engineer uh, at Facebook. So in this talk, uh, we're going to cover uh, what is AVA. So last year, we actually gave a talk on AVA. Uh, Chris Peterson, who's out there in the audience, uh, gave, gave the talk when it was really a preliminary design when we had an idea of what we wanted to do. In the past year, we've come a long way, and we've really developed uh, a fairly solid design, and we've learned a lot of things along the way. And so the, w one of the main things that we wanted to do in this talk was to share kind of where we're at right now, but also a little bit of the story of how we got there and some of the lessons that we learned to kind of contribute that back to the community. Um, and Michael will present use cases uh, and also his work at Disaggregate Labs. And so what were we setting out to do when we were envisioning AVA? Um, to put it very simply, we wanted to put PCIe, uh, build a PCI flashcard with M.2s. Um, what exactly that entailed was we wanted to put M.2s into a PCIe chem compliant uh, full height half length form factor. Um, now, one of the things that we really wanted to stress in this design was to keep it simple. So from a high-speed perspective, no PCIe switches, no redrivers. Uh, we also wanted it to be future-proof and true to uh, Facebook's design standards. We wanted it to be serviceable and low cost. And hopefully, as I'm going over the material, uh, you know, these design tenets will hopefully come out um, and be obvious as to why we had specific design decisions. Oh. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, so before we dive into uh, the design of AVA, I just wanted to briefly talk about why M.2. Um, so three main reasons at a very high level. First of all, it fits into all of our compute and storage platforms. Um, so uh, for example, like we here at Facebook, we have a lot of M.2s. So um, if you look at it from the perspective of like the big picture, we have a lot of drives that are available that have been qualified so that we can uh, leverage a lot of the legwork that we've done up front with selecting a specific drive and also qualifying it and essentially just leveraging that work, taking advantage of it across multiple platforms that we built. Um, second of all, it's a commodity. So definitely lots of vendors out there having M.2s in their um, roadmap, which is a great thing. Uh, the third thing is that it scales. Um, and so what will be hopefully apparent in this AVA design is that it'll be very easy to scale from 1M.2 to 4M.2s um, with the drives that you've already selected and qualified. Um, and uh, the performance will scale alongside with it because you're adding more M.2s. Um, so design overview, uh, really what we want to emphasize in this slide was that it's very simple. So you have a by 16 edge connector, and you connect it to four, um, <clears throat> four M.2 connectors, each of which has four lanes of PCIe Gen 3. Um, it's, I don't know why I keep saying that. Uh, whoops. Sorry. So uh, each of which, uh, each module is standard socket 3 M key pinout. Now, here's where we delve into you know, what the card really is. So you can see here that we have, uh, on the bottom right-hand side, uh, we have a 22-110 module installed. But from the, the top right, you have holes that you kind of see in the distance uh, here, where we support uh, moving the standoffs to 2280 lengths. Um, in terms of the connectors, we use a 5.8 millimeter high connector. Um, the reason for this is we want to support the D5 height module, so the maximum uh, thickness that the uh, M.2 specification provides. But in addition to that, for those of you familiar with the M.2 specification, they specify up to 4.2 height. We actually bumped it up to 5.8 because we wanted to support thermal interface materials. 
Um, and I'll talk more about specifically TIMS in the next slide, which talks about thermals. Um, and very briefly, we have top and bottom heat sinks. You can't see the bottom heat sinks in here, but I promise you in the next slide you'll see them. Um, you have top heat sinks one per M.2. Um, and again, true to Facebook uh, design standards, we have tool of service with all of our touch points outlined in green. So hopefully from this picture alone, you can kind of see how we're going to replace an M.2. Uh, next slide. Okay, so on to thermal. We have top and bottom heat sinks. So here is kind of where I try to outline all the heat sinks that are present in the card. So you have top heat sinks on the, the top right, and it's kind of exploded on the bottom left there. Um, it's one heat sink per M.2. And that was actually one of the critical decisions that we made um, in developing this product. And I'll talk a bit about why we made that later. Um, we have the bottom heat sink, which you see here kind of in the middle. Um, and in terms of you know, how the heat's supposed to flow, uh, on the bottom right, you see a side profile where you can see the purplish kind of colored squares. Those are the TIMs. So we put them over specific critical components um, and you can see that, uh, you know, from the top heat sink, it's pretty obvious you conduct the heat up to the top. Um, for the bottom, what we actually did was we conducted heat into the board. So from a layout perspective in the board, uh, in the area underneath the uh, bottom heat sink, we tried to fill as much copper as possible and stitch it with uh, thermal vias to try to increase the through plane conduction. So you have uh, heat dissipation through the bottom of the card as well. Um, so thermal is really, uh, it's really kind of the heart of the story of the development of AVA. Uh, we learned a lot of uh, valuable lessons in developing this. And let me just say that sticking 4M.2s into this form factor and trying to cool it is, it's not exactly a trivial task. Uh, thankfully, we have some pretty amazing thermal and mechanical engineers uh, on this project. Um, so when we started off, we wanted to keep it simple. Right. And you can see in the bottom left, uh, you know, how much more simpler can you get than putting an air duct in there? Right. Um, so this particular setup, you can kind of see that we have thermal interface material on the bottom, still conducting to the bottom side of the board. But the top really is just a shell where we, in this case, we taped it on um, and tried to see how it performed thermally. Uh, and you can see that it doesn't throttle, right? Um, it's, you know, 74 degrees, it's all right. But, you know, that kind of paints us into a corner if we ever have any, like, M.2s that are higher power than this. Um, and, of course, we want it to be uh, future-proof. So that wasn't going to work. So what else do you do? You throw more heat sinks at it, right? So uh, that's how we came up with the top heat sink with the thermal pad, again, conducting heat through the top. Um, and you can see from the data here that it performs significantly better. Um, and this was what we were going with for a long time, but one of the issues that we encountered, one of the lessons that we learned is if you think about a service flow. So let's say I want to replace a specific M.2. I take my server out, I take the card out, um, and I, I replace the specific M.2, but the problem here is the thermal pad pre-compression, right? So the other M.2s have been installed for a long time. The, the gap pads or the thermal interface materials have been pre-compressed. And so you install a new one in, um, we found that the perform performance degrades um, and that wasn't gonna work because we wanted it to be serviceable. So that's how we came up with a four heat sink design. So you have one heat sink per M.2 and uh, that offers us the ability to come up to the, to the box and replace individual M.2s. Uh, alternatively, you know, if you wanted to scale, right, you can add M.2s in much the same way, which you couldn't do with the previous design. Um, and operationally, one thing that I kind of have to talk about is that for this model, you know, the complexity here is in adding thermal interface materials to your M.2s and making sure that when you're replacing a new one, it's not pre-compressed. I mean, there's some uh, things that you do have to do beforehand, but in general, it enables us a lot of flexibility. Um, so just quickly walking through uh, the main touch points of the system, it's pretty obvious from the, the top right-hand side, just lift the heat sink up and then you can remove it and you can actuate the, uh, 
the latch that you see on the bottom right hand side and just take out the M.2. Everything's toolless and everything's super simple. Um, to kind of round out the design overview, just wanted to talk about the main high level points uh, of you know, what, what's in the system. Um, in terms of power, we support up to 18 amps total of continuous current for a 3.3 volt regulator to the M.2s. Um, all the I2C SM bus devices are powered off of 3.3 volt auxiliary supplied by the baseboard. Um, obviously, the uh, SM bus from the M.2s is 1.8, so we do have um, the uh, voltage regulator, or, sorry, the voltage translators for that. Um, quickly going over I2C, because we we're just talking about that. Uh, we have support for the SM bus connections for each of the M.2s. We have a free IDE prompt, so you can figure out what the card is in the system. And we also have status LED control. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have a picture of this, but on the front panel of the card, we have four bicolor LEDs. Um, one of them is driven by the M.2 itself, so it'll flash when it's active. Um, the other one, uh, you can drive from uh, the BMC, for example, and you can alert which M.2 is failing, so when you walk up to the system, you can figure out uh, which one to replace. Uh, we have a power monitor for the card uh, in its entirety, just upstream, um, and we have a clock buffer. Uh, speaking about clocks and reset, um, really simple, everything's just buffered. That's kind of the point of this specific slide. Um, moving on to the last item is PCI bifurcation. Um, so we are PCI ECAM compliant in that we connect, I think it's what, B81 to A1 so that we know that it's a by 16 card. Um, what we do in our specific application is we allow for auto detection so you know to bifurcate it into four by fours. What we do is we repurpose pin B31, um, which if I remember correctly, is a present two pin on the card. Um, so we pull it low. Uh, that allows the PCH to detect, okay, we, you know, this is a by 16 card, but we know that it's an AVA, so we'll bifurcate it into four by fours. And I'm gonna hand it off to Michael for use cases. Thank you. So my name is Michael Liberté. I'm uh, in uh, infrastructure product partnerships at Facebook. Um, I call myself an engineer, and then I always feel bad because this is an engineer. Uh, so I'm supposed to talk to you about how we use Ava at Facebook, and it's pretty obvious. I mean, we can share fairly little, but we use it for cache and databases and file systems cache. But um, in my previous life, I was actually selling storage. and. Out of all the large variety of offerings that uh, Facebook contributes into the OCP, I love this little thing the most. And the reason for it is because Flash and, um, and PCI Express connected Flash is all the rage right now, where usually when you're buying a PCI Express Flash card from a vendor, you will get a fixed amount of Flash, a fixed type of Flash, and also a fixed performance that the vendor determined is good for this particular card. Ava gives you all the flexibility that you need to build whatever you want with your in-server flash. You get the combined performance of up to four M.2 controllers. And you can mix and match for different applications. Uh, file system caches can come in mind, uh, databases, uh, uh, other high performance applications. But you can populate the card with different types of flash, uh, uh, small and fast, large and slow, and actually create tiered architectures within your uh, software um, infrastructure to really benefit from the flexibility. Uh, in another workshop that we presented a few, uh, a few minutes ago, we shared how software vendor are utilizing um, those cards and other OCP um, storage gear to enable uh, software-defined storage solutions. And whoever tested this, we have one vendor that is actually presenting right now. They tested this. They were able to easily saturate 10 gig cards, and they were begging for 25 and 50 gig cards because this, uh, those things are so performant. So today, you can already get software solutions that run well with AvaCard. And uh, like, like I said before, 
I can't express how well it fits into the entire disaggregated model that Facebook uses and we hope that everybody adopts and embraces in the near future. You, it really gives you the flexibility. And the card itself, because it's so simple, so straightforward, it really doesn't cost much. So you really don't pay much for, uh, for the board itself. You only spend your money on, on Flash, which is where you should be spending your money. Uh, that's all I had. Thank you. Any, any questions? questions? Yeah. There are oh. questions. Go ahead. Does the car support redundancy? I mean, if one M.2 fail, I mean. Uh, let's say you configure as a RAID 0? Uh, that's up to your software staff. So the question was, well, I guess everybody heard the question. So it's up to, to your um, uh, software stack. You see four devices in your operating system. It's up to you how to tell the RAID. So, so you, you can do hot plug? Um, no, the, the intent is not to do hot plug. So like for our, um, how it sits into our servers right now, um, it sits into, for instance, like a Tiago Pass, um, and you know Tiago Pass itself, you're not going to hot plug that. So you know, in Open Compute, whenever you maintain, ma ma do maintenance on a server, you unplug it from from power supply. Most most of our compute nodes, except for storage, maybe. Mm -hmm. you know, right. So you unplug it, then you need to pull out the card and replace individual M.2s. Um, Still gives you the flexibility that if some of your flash fails, you don't need to replace the entire card, but it's definitely not a it's built for a disaggregate architecture where software survives failure of any individual node, component, or rack even, which we uh, deploy here and pretty much every software vendor that writes their software for newer architectures, they also deploy, you know, use this resilient kind of paradigm. Okay, thank you. Can you pull the smart attributes out of every M.2 drive? For example, can you get the Right amplification, how many writes have been done? So I think that's you know, more of like a specific to like the drive. Um, so like th th this talk really focuses more on the hardware. So we do supply all the hardware for like out of band SM bus um, connections. Um, so that's really specific to your drive. Right, if I use smart CTL or so a command to the drive, will it respond back with the if it is Parameters. supported, if it yeah. is supported, then yes. Okay, directly. Yeah. Thanks. It would also be up to your BMC. There's a an addressable MUX there, so the BMC would have to know to go address that MUX to select each of the four cards. So part of this doesn't quite make sense to me that M.2 drives are notoriously poor in performance when you compare them to a larger controller. So meaning if I take four M.2 controllers, there's no way it equals the performance of one large one in terms of its durability, its error handling, its garbage collection, latency spikes, all of that stuff. So I'm really surprised you're using it for caching and file system caching and all these things which are generally pretty stressful for an SSD. And I'm wondering why you don't just carve up one large SSD, which you can do today. I can basically bifurcate a single SSD into four zones and get all the application determinism, but much better wear leveling, uh, endurance, everything else out of the flash. So it's, it all depends on how your software is implemented and written. We implemented our software so any component can fail, is expected to fail. As a matter of fact, we fail them on a regular basis just to make sure that our infrastructure remains resilient, there's no new bugs introduced. So for us, when we combine, for us, when we combine this consideration with considerations of costs, simplicity, and supply chain availability, there, there are a massive organization within Facebook, uh, capacity engineering, that determine those kinds of things. And they're determined, they take in a, in a smaller environments, I, I assume you're right. But in large, yes. I get what you would, all that makes sense if you're doing read heavy, 
which mm -hmm. Facebook must do a lot of. Mm -hmm. But if you have stuff like caching, like mm -hmm. you're talking about, then I don't get it. But there, okay. there are different types of caching. So if I, I can't go too much into details, but for example, if I take an, an example of ZFS, ZFS, you wouldn't probably use this for Zill, for, but, but you would uh, use it for layer two, two cache maybe because or a read cache. Yeah, it would make sense. Yeah, layer two arc okay. is, is read cache. Yeah. Then I get it. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, I do want to remind you that uh, all the presentations from all the engineering forums will be posted on the OCP website, uh, they say, by the weekend. So I see a lot of people taking pictures. You can probably go out on Monday and get the real slide. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you, Dominic and Michael. Uh, that's the end of this uh, this track right now. For we'll resume after lunch. Thank you for coming.